Hello and thanks for joining us. On this episode of To The Outdoors, we're gonna take a look at some of the biodiversity in our ecology, and then we'll offer up a few ideas on how to better our relationship with the planet. First off, large animals. They're often the poster children for conservation movements. They can be both majestic and intimidating, and their very nature can be a catalyst for learning our proper place on Mother Earth. An apex predator is one that occupies a top spot in the food chain without other natural predators. Humans are arguably the ultimate in this category, but even we have harbored fear of other predators, wolves in particular. Humanity has long had a love-hate relationship with these striking mammals, and perhaps it's because we have so much in common. They care for their young, they're territorial, they provide food for their young, um, and they disperse when crowded conditions happen. They're a lot like us. And maybe that's why some of us love them and some of us hate them. Wolves now occupy only about 10% of their original range in the continental U.S. and their populations have dwindled to less than 10,000. Still, efforts to reestablish wolves have been moderately successful. Yellowstone National Park has been a learning lab since 1995 when they restored wolves to the habitat which had seen the last one killed in 1927. Former UB professor Joe Allen has been leading expeditions there for decades and has seen the effects of their return firsthand. One thing that has definitely happened is the population of elk in Yellowstone has been reduced uh, from about 15,000 animals to about five or 6,000 animals. And that could be nothing but positive on the landscape where there were no predators before and the elk just ru ran roughshod over the ecology. Over two decades later, the Yellowstone wolf population is still relatively small, now under 100, but their presence has taught a valuable lesson. We have learned that we can't manage individual species appropriately. We have to manage an entire ecosystem. The movement to bring back wolves is alive across the country, including the Adirondacks, and they are thriving in Ontario's Algonquin Park. We here in Western New York can help the cause. Within the political system, the people who care about wildlife are the ones we should be voting into office. Whenever there's a clash between ecology and economy, it's usually ecology that loses out. But often the two can live comfortably together. A shining example of this thrives in Benezet, Pennsylvania. This small town is home to a growing population of elk, as well as a beautiful visitor center to educate people about the animals and the surrounding environment. This magnificent herd is enriched local resources, both man-made and natural. It was put here to get out a clear, consistent conservation education message, but also to drive economic development around this industry called elk watching and ecotourism. It was intentional. People were already coming to view this animal and to, to be in this two million acres of public land, but they really had no destination and no place to go. The history of elk in North America has not always been a good one. Once roaming over much of the Northeast from Canada to Pennsylvania, eastern elk populations were in steep decline by the 1800s, and in September of 1877, the last elk was killed. It was a, a combination of loss of habitat and conflict with man primarily agriculture, man building roads, and so forth. So there were conflicts there. Pennsylvania soon took action to repair what they had destroyed. In 1913, Rocky Mountain elk were reintroduced to the state, imported from Yellowstone out west, where they had an overpopulation problem. The 50 elk purchased cost about $30 each. The elk we have today, the offspring of those reintroductions, we have not had an introduction since the, uh, the, uh, the only one, 1913 through 26. Since the reintroduction, the population has waxed and waned, again reaching low points in the 1950s and the 70s. Browsing damage to local farms caused the elk to be looked at as a nuisance animal, and they were allowed to be culled if considered such. Public sentiment was not on the side of the elk, but that eventually changed, and when it did, that made all the difference. This herd can survive here if Man wants that to happen. So you start to address conflicts and you start to change minds and you start to erect fences and, and create forage plots and do research and talk to the public. 
and, and the population responded and responded and continued to respond, and it does to this day. Now the herd is a valued part of the community. Although hunting is still permitted, the area surrounding Benezet is a sanctuary where no hunting is allowed, an area where these majestic mammals can live their lives in peace while also enhancing those of their human benefactors and the local economy. This is a much better place than it was 30, 35 years ago. People are supporting our facility, they're supporting the local businesses, one feeds the other. It works out extremely well. The timber rattlesnake once was fairly common in New York State, but now is on the threatened list. Only found in the southern tier, the northernmost edge of its range in the United States. The species has long been seen as a threat, surrounded by myth and misinformation. Fortunately for both man and snake, research has shed much light on this misunderstood reptile. The New York DEC has been conducting studies since 2012. They've used surgically implanted transmitters to track the snakes. In total, I think we've transmitted 10 individuals over the past um, five, six years. Um, we have started to back off of that now that we've gotten this much information and trying to do more telemetry in areas that we haven't studied or haven't been studied in a long time. The study revealed some important information regarding population size in the area. Timber rattlers are a very secretive species and the transmitters allowed the team to track them to their dens or hibernacula. The snakes, which are normally on their own during warm months, gather together to hibernate in these underground homes during the cold months. Using that telemetry, the mark and recapture, we were able to kind of get um, an occupancy kind of an idea for these hibernaculas. And then in 2015, we added the time-lapse trail camera photography study along with it. And that allowed us to kind of get an abundance idea at these different hibernaculas. How many snakes do we actually have versus just the needle in the haystack snakes that we've been finding? The researchers located 10 dens within the area, yielding some interesting information. We were surprised to see that some dens were extremely healthy with, you know, 50 plus snakes. And some of them had a measly eight, you know, and so it all kind of depended on which one it was and they were extremely variable. Because of their tendency to den together, it was easy in the past for people to wipe out whole populations quickly. Bounties were offered in the past to kill snakes and this was a main factor in the decline of their numbers in New York. People really didn't like snakes and then when you put a price tag on them, it's like a perfect little scenario um, for folks to go out and there's, there's people still around that remember going out um, as kids or, or with family members to these different areas. They know exactly where they were, you know, and they'd go out and, um, you know, dump gasoline down the hibernaculas or whatever they could do to get all these snakes out to collect those bounties. Now it's illegal in New York to kill timber rattlesnakes, and as we learn more, we understand their true nature. They're important for rodent control, which in turn helps control the spread of Lyme disease. Although they can do damage if provoked, they are actually quite docile and should be revered, not feared. Instead of seeing the negatives in some of these things, we need to kind of turn and see the positives and enjoy the fact that we still have this chance, that this habitat is still healthy enough to sustain the species, and um, we're lucky to have that. Though large animals are amazing, it would be folly to ignore the importance of the small creatures of the earth. Though we may not always see them, they're always there, and they provide important eco-services that the planet cannot live without. The order Lepidoptera includes all moths and butterflies. Together, they number over 180,000 different species, and it's thought that 160,000 of these are moths, with many yet to be described. In the U.S. alone, there are 11,000 moth species. Despite their numbers, moths remain less studied than butterflies. Is that difference because moths are nocturnal? Do you think that's why they're less studied than butterflies? That, that probably has a lot to do with it, but also um, a lot of moths tend to be smaller, more obscure. A lot of them are not very colorful. 
so they don't catch a lot of people's attention like the more colorful butterflies. The easiest way to tell the difference between butterflies and moths are the structure of their antennae. Butterflies have either hooked, knobbed, uh, or clubbed antennae. Moths have antennae that are either hair-like, without any swelling at the end, or without a hook, or they're comb-like. They have side branches like the teeth of a comb. Those moth antennae serve a very important function in their mating cycle, and they're amazingly sensitive. When searching for a mate, male moths are attracted to chemicals known as pheromones, which are released by the female moth. There was a researcher at the University of Illinois named Gilbert Waldbauer, and he and his students actually did a study where they tagged uh, male cecropias and release them at varying distances from caged virgin females and they attracted that caged virgin female attracted a male as far away as 11 miles. Moths also play a critical and underappreciated role in the environment. Like butterflies, they're pollinators and as they are mainly herbivores feeding on plants, they serve another important function for the planet. Well, they're important in recycling plant material. They, they in one step they take plant material and they transform it into um, creeping, crawling uh, insect biomass, which is then available in the food chain for higher level predators. And they're not without aesthetic appeal. Many moths, such as the underwing moths, are quite beautiful, and the giant silk moths are both large and spectacular, but have very short lives. They don't feed as adults. They don't even have functional mouth parts. So really their whole purpose as adults is mating and passing on their genes. So they're geared for mate finding and reproduction, and that's it. Though we may not often see them, they are clearly an important part of our Mother Earth, nocturnal creatures that help shed light on the beauty of nature. Every species comes with its own story, and sometimes there's common themes in those stories, and sometimes they're pretty unique themes. So they're all, but they're all interesting. <laughs>
water pool. The vernal pools, uh, many of them will dry up um, at the end of July or August. Before they disappear, the pools can be teeming with life. One of spring's most fascinating displays is the annual salamander breeding migration. They're um, under, under the ground surface during the winter months, uh, presumably below the frost line. And once uh, we lose this snow cover in the, our woodlands and we get a, um, our first um, spring rain or late winter rain, they emerge to start this migration. The amphibians then head to vernal pools to breed, which often can occur in only one night, after which the male salamanders return to their home territory. And then the females stay in the pond for one or uh, more days and begin to lay the egg masses that will result in, um, you know, larval salamanders within a few weeks. Unfortunately, man-made barriers are often a fatal hindrance to the salamanders. We get a lot of uh, road mortality um, if the roads that they're crossing are heavily used. Which makes it all the more important to preserve secluded habitat. Alexander Preserve in the Southern Tier is where these salamanders were observed. It's a perfect environment and it's one of many being protected by the Nature Sanctuary Society of Western New York. It's so easy to damage these habitats through purchase and protection. We're attempting to preserve, you know, what diversity we have and, uh, for future generations to enjoy. Few animals are more feared and misunderstood than bats, and they've suffered greatly at the hands of man. But their reputation could not be further from the truth. They pose no threat and, to the contrary, play an important role in our environment. In Chautauqua County, research is ongoing in an effort to help conserve the bat population there. And what I'm ultimately trying to do is identify environmental predictor variables that help explain bat activity so that we can find maybe places that are the most important to them and refine conservation efforts and make sure that we're um, if we're trying to do something to benefit bats, we can benefit them in the best way possible. Some species are being decimated by white nose syndrome, a fungal disease that was carried here from Europe in 2007. It is now spread across the country and has been found as far away as Washington State. One of our most common bats in New York, the little brown bat, has suffered declines from 90 to 99 percent. White nose syndrome has been termed one of the most catastrophic declines of wildlife in modern history, so something up there with the passenger pigeon and the bison. Um, so this is a really serious population crash that's happened. In the last decade, it's estimated that globally, bats have declined by a third to half of the total population. Their loss will also be ours, as bats contribute much in ecosystem services. Just in Chautauqua County, bats are providing almost $10 million a year just to Chautauqua County. And that's through control of insect pests for the agricultural industry. Research will go far to help stem this fatal tide, but landowners can also help out. Erecting bat houses like these can provide a safe haven. The colony here has lived on the land since the Civil War. We can protect where they hibernate and we can protect where they rear their pups. And we have active maternity colony here where every year these females are rearing pups at this same place. And so because they go back to the same place, once you have that colony established, putting up a bat house is, is one of the best things you can do. Education and a change in attitude will also help make sure bats survive into the future. We victimize these groups of animals at our own peril because we really need to be more concerned about a world without bats than we actually need to be scared of bats themselves. We must also try to be aware of humanity's place in the grand scheme of life on Earth. We've done damage on a tremendous scale, but we also have the ability to repair that damage. Awareness and responsibility are first steps
towards a reconciliation with the planet. Technology has accelerated at an awe-inspiring pace over the past few decades. It's gone from having a mere influence on our lives to almost total dominance. Though it has improved many aspects of life, it's caused damage as well, including disconnecting us from nature. It does, you know, and, and I'd say it even more than that, I think it disconnects us from other people, right? And, and I think as part of that, I think a lot of that's mediated from an increasing disconnection from nature. It takes our focus and it narrows it. And what you're focusing on is generally a lot, uh, it's disturbing, it's, it's negative. Whereas when you go into nature, all that melts away. There is evidence that our addiction to technology such as social media can lead us down a very dark path. We do know that increased amount of time focused in on screens and technology can be associated with things like anxiety and depression. And it's usually sort of mediated by an increased sense of social isolation, oftentimes a decrease in our self-esteem. They're literally driving us away from each other. And um, you need to feel empathy, not only for nature, but for each other. So how does the natural world help us recover from our self-inflicted wounds? It's often a very simple formula. Perhaps just a hike in the woods can do it. That's one of the great things about nature is if you're engaging with it, you're also probably doing other healthy things. You're moving your body, you know, you're getting fresh air, you're doing positive aspects for your overall health. Unfortunately, we're destroying the very cure we need to achieve a healthy balance. Taking responsibility for our own action seems a good first step to restore that. We here in the United States are a minority in terms of the world population, and we use a majority of the natural resources. Every little thing that you do is actually a bigger impact than in many other places in the world. We need to lead. Finding that balance is something we need to do now for the sake of generations still to come. I'm a big believer in getting out into the world and seeing the world for what it is. It's, it's our home, it's beauty, it's our salvation. Human societies have a long history of using animals as entertainment. It's a practice that's been accepted and encouraged for thousands of years, and much of it has become cultural tradition. But not all customs are good, especially when they involve the oppression of other living creatures. I think the key thing that distinguishes animals and entertainment from other contexts is the idea that someone is profiting off of your amusement related to an animal. And that can be in circuses, that can be in rodeos, that could be in zoo, uh, zoos and aquariums for some people, um, and you know, certainly in films and, and TV. Animals in these situations are forced into increasingly unnatural roles and are made to do so with a variety of training that can often be cruel and both physically and mentally damaging. The system that supports the idea that this is acceptable has roots in our belief that animals are unequal and suffer less than humans. The idea that we kind of um, have dominion, right, or we're kind of above other animals, um, you know, I think has a very, very long history and it's going to take a long time to change that. The negative effects are not only limited to the animals involved. Condoning this kind of behavior does harm to the human animal as well. The ethical argument is that um, if we're capable of doing harm to animals intentionally, then, then we create a kind of person that is capable of doing that harm to other people. Perhaps the first step to change is to admit that the problem exists. You have to implicitly at least acknowledge that that was harmful. And that can be, I think, really hard for people to kind of come around to. And we see that with other social movements as well. It's a change that can be affected at the individual level. These are settings that are designed for profit. And, you know, you, you have the opportunity to kind of say, mm, I'm not going to choose this. I'm going to choose something else. Um, and so to me, that's, I think, the biggest thing that people can do. Well, the more research that people do that shows how intelligent animals are, how complicated their emotional lives can be, how complicated their social lives are, we see that similarities make it really hard to deny the fact that we are animals and that animals are in many ways just like us.
Worldwide smoking causes over 7 million deaths a year, but cigarettes do damage to the environment as well. Among other things, growing tobacco contributes to deforestation as land is cleared for crops, and it's estimated that the tobacco industry cuts down over 600 million trees a year. Another seemingly small offense is actually a huge source of pollution. Discarded cigarette butts are the most littered items on Earth. 4.5 trillion cigarette butts are purchased, cigarettes are purchased a year, and two-thirds of those ends up on the ground. The problem is not only the toxic chemicals that leach from the tobacco itself, but the filters on the cigarettes as well. They're made of cellulose, cellulose acetate, which looks very much like cotton, cotton fibers, so people think they just go away, but they don't. They're made of plastic and they're with us for decades. Pollution doesn't have to be littered directly into the water to impact it. When it rains, anything that's upland on parking lots, on roadways, will run off to the low point, which is our waterways. It's a problem that has galvanized many to action. In the village of Hamburg, a group of six senior citizens formed a group called the Butt Kickers. They take a three-pronged approach to tackling the problem in their community. First is awareness. Let's educate ourselves. The second is to assess if we have enough ash receptacles for the butt. And three, let's do some cleanup activities. The butt kickers are part of a larger collaboration across western New York. The Buffalo Niagara water keepers are also instrumental in fighting this scourge. We collaborate with a ton of different environmental groups, and we're also getting you know, schools involved in cleanups and businesses involved in cleanups and volunteer efforts. It's something that can be affected on an individual level each and every day. All it takes is to pick them up and toss them in the trash. Especially when uh, they first came out, it was the culture just to stump it out on the ground or to like flick it because it was like super cool. Uh, so I don't think they realize how much of an impact that the one cigarette butt can have. We can tackle it together. We just need to keep spreading the word and keep getting more and more people involved. Hopefully, you'll be inspired by these stories. Though caring for our Mother Earth can often seem like a daunting task, if we each take responsibility for what we do to the environment, collectively, we can make a huge difference. Until next time, taking you to the outdoors, I'm Terry Belke.